Here we go. That's it. That's it. It's the uh, point of no return. That's it. <laughs> All right, turn the back of the chair towards me just a, just a little bit. Like this? Perfect. All right. If you need me to hold up at any point, just let me know, all right? Do you think it's going to hurt? Nah. But just to adjust your arm or anything, anything like that. Yeah. Meet Pale Bo, a digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. My name is Pale Bo, and I'm a longtime radio producer. In 2013, I started planning to become a digital nomad and a full-time traveler. Three years later, I had sold my house, my car and all my furniture. And in July 2016, I set out on a quest to visit every country in the world. As I'm traveling, I'm running my production company Radio Guru, where I'm producing podcasts and other sound designs for clients, and do lectures and workshops about radio advertising for radio stations and advertising communities around the world. In this podcast, I'm taking you along on my journey, and I'm sharing my ups and downs, and let you listen in to conversations with some interesting people I meet along the way. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. I've arrived to uh, to Nashville, and uh, there are live music everywhere here on Broad Street, and it's a it's a regular Wednesday afternoon, and uh, live bands everywhere uh, at around four o'clock. Uh, imagine what it's like on a Saturday night. Walking down Broadway, listening to all the music that's coming out of all the bars and all the street musicians. There are guys uh, beating on 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 plastic drums. There are uh, guys playing the harmonica and a saxophone. But as I'm as I'm walking down uh, Broadway, let me just uh, mention that this episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that searches all the major travel sites. In one simple search, it finds the best prices on hotels around the world. Hotels25.com, it's best price guaranteed. I left Chattanooga this morning at um, quarter to eight in the morning. My cow surfing host, Casey, was uh, going to work, so I left early. And um, instead of going the direct route here to, to Nashville, I took a detour north of Chattanooga. Uh, it's it's a very very beautiful area with a, a beautiful scenery, nice uh, nice waterfalls and forests and mountains. It was it was quite a, a scenic route I took there. Instead of taking the highway uh, directly up to Nashville, I arrived here at around three o'clock in the afternoon. So I had a few hours to kill before my next cow surfing host gets uh, gets home from work. His name is Steve, and I can't wait to uh, to meet him as well. He sounds like a really nice guy. I'm staying here in Nashville for two nights before I, I head further north. I think I'll go into to one of these bars. Forty miles from the nearest gravel road. We've been laughing A little bit later, I'm at Steve's house at the time we agreed on. It's a house with a big lawn in a residential area around seven miles north of Broadway in downtown Nashville. But I don't see Steve. 
I sent him a couple of messages that he doesn't respond to. He tells me later that was because he was on his bike on his way home at that time. It doesn't matter, I'm in no hurry. So I open up my computer in the car and starts doing some writing. Half an hour later, a guy shows up. No, no. It turns out to be Steve's friend Miles that rents a room in Steve's house. Are you the surfer? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you were coming. No? <laughs> no, I didn't. No. He probably has it on the, uh, yeah. the thing. We uh, rode back and forth a couple of times. Where are you from? Denmark. I love Denmark. You been there? No. No. <laughs> That's a good way to start going. What's your name? Hello. What? Hello. We go inside and Miles asks me a quite surprising question as one of the first like things. The boys or the girls? Uh, I like the girls. Do you like the boys or the girls? And he adds, almost equally surprising, that he has a girlfriend. Yes, I have a girlfriend. Okay. Are you thinking? Yeah. But it turns out that he's talking about his wonderful Very dog. Yeah. I can tell. Absolutely. Yeah. So you are okay. How long have you been waiting? Uh, uh, half an hour. Oh, wow. I'm so sorry. Yeah, this. no problem. No problem. I just took my laptop and uh, your car did some writing. What, what's your name? As soon as we Miles? enter the house, yeah. it's obvious that this is a place where oh. musicians live. He'll, he'll be the first room so is a rehearsal him. room. Lots of instruments and amplifiers. And I can imagine that this is a room where a lot of hours are being spent. It doesn't surprise me. We are in Nashville, where the music is alive more than probably anywhere else in the world. It's also quite clear that this is a house where only young men live. It doesn't strike me as a house where a woman lives, and you can feel that there's also kind of relaxed that if you get to clean up and do the vacuuming every day. But I am a guy myself, and I'm fine with that. And it's a house with a lot of atmosphere. Shortly after, Steve shows up. Hi. He was waiting 30 minutes. Oh, sorry. That's yeah, okay. How's it going? Steve. That's good. Hi, Steve. How was your name pronounced? Pala. Pala? Yeah. All right. Good to meet you. Yeah, thank you. So you met Miles already? Yeah. Carter? Yeah. He seems totally cool and relaxed. And he seems like a sort of an artistic type with interesting clothes and funny hair, you know, shaved in the sides and long on the top and very colorful. No? That's what he does. That is what he does. Well, I, uh, that place is just around the corner if you want to go grab some dinner there. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right, shall we head out? Yeah, All right. So this is where you... Yeah, this is where I play the music. The magic. This is where the magic happens. This is where the tragic happens. Yeah. Oh, they're so good at their chicken that they don't need to be good at any other aspect of running a business or running a restaurant. Okay. Uh, and so to a large extent, they aren't. No. Like, it can be a very long wait. The place smells like nail polish from the salon next door. Uh, <laughs> there are sometimes just days where you go there and they just don't have food because the delivery guy didn't show up. <laughs> That's only happened to me once so far, but it was a little bit terrifying. Um, and they, they, they sell chicken and sides. And the sides are okay, but they tend to add 30 minutes or more to your wait. So they're not really worth it. No, okay. So what I always recommend doing is you go there, you order some chicken, and then you walk to like a fast food restaurant or a gas station for, for you know, drinks and sides and things like that. Okay. <laughs> After a short walk, we reach Prince's Hot Chicken Shack, and we order our chicken and and head on towards KFC for sides. So Steve, tell me about yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Steve. I'm a Canadian by way of Wisconsin who currently lives in Nashville program computers, uh, but mostly I try to play a lot of music. Yeah, and you, 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 you told me that you have several bands. Several. Uh, a, a glitch punk band called Regdar and the Fighters, a psychedelic band called Nuclear Bubble Rap, an adventure rock band called Lipstick, and a fake punk band called Snake Vomit. A, a fake punk, punk band. Fake punk band. Uh, we play like short grindcore songs that basically what happens is the week before a show, we go to a steak and shake or whatever, and we just sit down and we write down 40 to 70 song titles. And then the day of the show, we get on stage, 
and our vocalist will shout out one of those song titles, and then we'll play whatever we think that song should be. On YouTube, I find a video of Steve's punk band, Snake Vomit. You see a little stage, and the first thing you notice is a guy in a teddy bear costume. He's got a gigantic head on, and he's the lead singer. Inside the head, there's a microphone, and then he has the list of the song titles and a small lamp so he can read them. We are Snake Vomit! You wanted the best, you got the best! This first song is called Let's Get Ready to Mumble! Yeah. That was the entire first song, their big hit, Let's Get Ready to Mumble. And that's how it continues. 20 second song after 20 second song for around 20 minutes. This next song is called Mandela vs. Gandhi, Rage in the Cage 98. You can watch the entire concert in the link that I put on the radiovagabond.com should you have the time for that. The next song is called Robocop vs. Blade, Fleeing in the Ring, 98. You know, they'll call out, this next song is called I Hate the Government. Then we're like, okay, how does I Hate the Government go? And then we guess. <laughs> you don't even agree on a key? or? No, we, we try to play off each other a little bit. It, it, so... <laughs> It's, it's weird because we're all, all of us are vocalists, really. Uh, our, our vocalist is primarily a singer. I'm primarily a bassist and a singer, but I play drums in this band, despite not knowing how to play the drums at all. Our guitarist is primarily a vocalist, but he plays and, and has tendinosis, so his wrists just don't work. Okay. Uh, but he still plays guitar. Uh -huh. And our, our bassist is primarily a vocalist, and she usually borrows an instrument that she doesn't know how it's tuned. <laughs> Name some of the other titles. Uh, uh, so, let's see. Uh, we did a song called Nelson Mandela vs. Gandhi, Rage in the Cage 98. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good one. There's the ever-popular I Got My Dick Stuck in a Bicycle and the follow-up I Got My Bicycle Stuck in a Dick. <laughs> Robocop, the song. There's a lot of songs about bears. Yeah. Do, uh, do, you, have, do you ever play a song and say, hey, that was, that was actually quite good. <laughs> let's, let's do the, the same, same a, one again next time. A little bit, actually. Uh, for some reason, for a while, we got hung up on the idea that uh, every song with the word dark in its name is better uh, with shark. Or anything that rhymes <laughs> with shark. So, you know, uh, we did Iron Maiden's Fear of the Shark. We did MacArthur's Shark. We did It's Always Sharkist Before the Dawn. And uh, the first time we played one of those, the guitarist just played a and that became how all of those songs go. <laughs> Death Cab for Cuties, I Will Follow You Into the Shark. All of these songs are 20 seconds long, and so in the, the, the four shows that we've played, I've got 200 different tracks on my computer. So I have my MP3 player set to randomize, and it's just constantly playing these, you know, awful little songs like this song is called more doom bears more doom bears <laughs> and then we move on to the next song this next song is called robocop versus batman frank miller kumite but some of the other bands are melodic as well <laughs> like, <laughs> all, all of the other bands sync. that i'm in like write songs and practice and you know are organized <laughs> You are listening to the Radio Vagabond podcast. If you like what you hear, please leave a review in iTunes. If you're listening on an iPhone, you can actually do it right there within your podcast app. The moment I realized I was actually a, a, a that I was really a bassist, fundamentally, rather than just some guy who would play bass because that was the instrument that he had, was a, when I first joined the psychedelic band, I showed up to practice and we played through all the songs, and the, the keyboardist slash vocalist was like, you're the first person who's ever actually learned the bass lines. I was like, dude, nobody, okay, I, I guess that's because I'm a real bassist. Yeah, yeah, because if, if there's a difference between being a bassist and a bass player. Right. Yeah. 
Right, this, this is Nashville. Every band, or you know, 50% of bands, have a bass player who's a guitarist who just wasn't as good as the other guitarist in the band, so he had to play the bass. Yeah, that was me when I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up playing the bass in a, in, a, in a big band, and I wasn't very good. They gave me sheet music and I don't read it, Ooh. so uh, I had to sort of work my way through it and then memorize it and pretend I was reading it. That's, that's still how I deal with sheet music. <laughs> yeah. Radical dreamers, let's take a ride, let's fly away. So we, we just ordered some very spicy chicken. Uh, that's a, a local restaurant. Uh, Prince's Hot Chicken. How did that, how did that come about? Uh, the, the story that I was told is that, uh, I forget his name, but the original Mr. Prince was a noted philanderer who cheated on all his girlfriends, came home one day at six in the morning and said to his girlfriend, and you know, six in the morning after being out all night partying, came home and said, I'm hungry woman, make me some fried chicken for breakfast. And she was like, all right, that's it. I'm murdering this guy. And so she fried him up some chicken and then she dumped all of the spices in the cupboard on it and then handed it to him and he said, well, this is actually really good. Uh, and then he took the recipe and it became a world famous thing. And then, and then we're going to KFC for science. Right. Because Prince's is so good at chicken that they don't need to be good at anything else, which means that it's faster to order your food than walk to KFC and get fries there than it is to wait for them to make fries at Prince's. All right. All right. Uh, can we get a large fries and a large claw, please? <laughs> I'm in Athens, well, Athens of the South. That's what they call Nashville, or at least that's what they used to call it uh, back in 1897 when they had sort of a world expo. They call the expo Tennessee Centennial and International Exposition. And as a part of that, they, they built a one-to-one -one replica of the Parthenon, you know, the, the big iconic building at Acropolis in Athens in, in, in Greece and they made it out of wood and plaster because it was only a temporary uh, thing. But in 1920, when the, it was starting to, to, to crumble and, and, and fall apart, the city authorized a reconstruction of this landmark with permanent materials. They didn't use marble like they did in Greece, but here it is still standing in Centennial Park here in, in Nashville. The whole construction was, of course, uh, quite expensive. And when they nearly finished, a big tornado came and, and uh, almost knocked it over. The roof was completely gone, so they, they had to start over. And that took another five years in order to raise the money and, and do it. But here it is. They have some art inside. And inside the big room, there's a huge statue. In fact, it's the biggest indoor statue anywhere in the world. It's Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. A golden, beautiful, gigantic statue is inside this building. Definitely worth a, a visit if you, if you ever get here to Nashville, Tennessee. Today I've been visiting the local Toastmasters Club. Um, that's an organization that's uh, all over the world. It's sort of a networking thing where people gather and uh, and and improve their skills on on giving talks. Uh, and uh, I, I've, I've been to a few meetings in, in Denmark and, and when I was going here to Nashville I looked up online and found this local um, Toastmasters club so I asked if I could, uh, could, could come visit them and they said yes, will you do a talk? and I said yeah, why not? so I uh, prepared um, uh, seven minutes um, talking about why I'm traveling and how I'm doing it and um, and uh, they really liked it. In fact, there was there was a vote on which talk was the best, and I won. <laughs> uh, 
I am not saying this to brag, I'm just uh, stating the facts. And after that, I felt so um, full of energy that I went downtown in Nashville and for some reason I saw myself walking into a tattoo parlor and said, uh, I'm a virgin, uh, I don't have any tattoos, so I think it's about time. And so, in fact, I, I booked the time, uh, time slot in a few hours. I'm going back to this place and getting my very first ever tattoo. And this is almost as scary as doing the bungee jump in, in Macau Tower. Whew. Actually, it was Steve that recommended the tattoo parlor and told me that it was probably the best in Nashville. So I tell him about it when I get home. Steve, what have I done? I booked a time for tattoo. Oh yeah, you booked it. <laughs> oh <laughs> no! Woo. It's just yeah. about as scary as as being on top of a cow tower, leaning forward. Yeah. I am so. <laughs> oh my god, I'm doing it. So I'm I'm here going back. They they had a slot at six o'clock. So yeah. a little bit later, I'm back at Black Thirteen Tattoo Parlor. It's big and nice and clean and seems very professional. My tattoo artist is called Nathan. He's a smiling guy with a big beard. He's got a big nose ring and huge earrings. You know, the ones that give you big holes in the ears. And then he's got tattoos everywhere, even on his bald head. He sits me down in a dentist chair cleans my arm and transfers the artwork, which is a drawing that my daughter made. And then he puts on black rubber gloves and gets ready. Here we go. That's it. That's it. It's the point of no return. That's it. <laughs> All right, turn the back of the chair towards me just a, just a little bit. Like this? Do you think it's going to hurt? Nah. But just to adjust your arm or anything, anything like that. Yeah. Actually, it didn't hurt, and on the way out, I meet Nathan again. He's out there to get a cigarette in a break. So Nathan, uh, when I said uh, it's, it's my first time, you didn't say mine too. <laughs> I am so glad. Uh, how long have you been uh, a tattoo artist? Uh, eight years now. Eight years. Yep. How do you get into it? Just by uh, having tattoos yourself and uh, finding it interesting? Or? Um, no, I uh, always kind of wanted to do it when I was a kid, and... Uh, just kind of got the opportunity and uh, took it. Yeah. Can you tell me about your tattoos? This is radio, so uh, tell me w w what tattoos have you got? Oh, all kinds of stuff. Um, I got a lot of biomechanical stuff and a lot of traditional style. Uh, kind of a big mix. I like all the all the different styles. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And you and you got it on your skull as well. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's not something uh, you see every day. No, not every day, that's for sure. Was that a big decision? It was, yeah, it was. Um, and I made it kind of early because I didn't want to um, be able to have a plan B, kind of. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was either make tattooing work or don't after that point. So yeah, it was yeah. kind of a... Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you still have room for more, you told me. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always room for more. What are some of the craziest stuff that people have... Uh, have asked you to do <laughs> oh man I've, I've seen all kinds of stuff uh, probably the weirdest thing was uh, a woman wanted a cheetah on her butt line well everywhere we put the stencil she didn't like it except for where it looked like it was jumping out of her butthole oh my so, god <laughs> that one was a weird one that one was kind of weird <laughs> but uh, yeah there, there's been a lot of them through the years oh my god yeah. <laughs> But in fact, uh, it was not as painful as I thought. Yeah, it's uh, it's most people that usually hype it up in their heads and have yeah. it have it worked up so bad that yeah. You know, well, the only girl that's ever cried in my chair was crying before I turned the machines on. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. she had just worked herself up and scared herself so yeah, bad. Yeah, and it's 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 like uh, the dentist. The sound of a dentist drill is this this the same with the sound of a tattoo machine. Yeah. Oh, I love the sound. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I head back to Broadway to experience the street after the sun goes down and get a nice big beer after my brave and some might say silly decisions. 
that was almost it for this episode. In a minute you can join me in the car as I'm driving out of Nashville. But before that, let me remind you that I would be so thrilled if you would give me some stars in Apple Podcast or in your podcast app. And if you have a few minutes, please write a few lines in a review. It helps other people find this podcast. You can reach me on mail if you have any feedback or questions or tips for me on what to see and who to talk to when I get to a new destination. I promise that I'll answer any email I get on mail at theradiovagabond.com. You can follow me real time, where I am right now, on the official Facebook page, facebook.com slash Vagabond, and on Instagram and Twitter as Radio Vagabond. Find all these links at theradiovagabond.com, where you can also see a lot of pictures, like the tattoo that is now permanently on my left arm. This episode of the Radio Vagabond podcast is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com, It's a website that helps you find the best prices on guest houses, hotels, and hostels around the world in one simple search. It searches a bunch of the biggest uh, hotel search sites in the world uh, in one simple search, and that saves you both time and money. I had a couple of great days in Nashville. I made some new friends, my host Steve and his roommate Miles, and I also got a permanent souvenir that will remind me of my time in Nashville. It's a drawing that my daughter did a couple of years ago. She only did it in a few minutes, but for me it defines her style and is now permanently on my left arm. My next stop is Indianapolis in Indiana, and I'm so looking forward to that. My name is Palavo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya!